Thank you, Sasha. We've we've got a, a number of questions in the in the chat. Uh, there's been some interesting conversations in the chat as well, um, and so I'm going to try to to start um, go back to the top and find out where our questions really start, and then kind of kind of go from there. Uh, the first one is. Uh, it's from Jeff. Uh, in the last hundred years, we've lost more soil carbon than we put back. How many years will it take to re reach uh, for us to reach a sustainable level of soil carbon and produce food, fuel, and fiber we need? Well, that's an excellent question. And I wish I had the answer. So yeah, the, the thing is that there is really, as far as soil comes into play, uh, there is really no simple answer that, you know, that's, that's X years and then you will be um, back at the, at the carbon uh, that that soil had prior to it being first plowed for agriculture. Uh, the thing is that unfortunately, even answering this question, okay, I have this particular soil, I have this particular field, some 200 years ago, it was converted to agriculture. Um, and for example, from having a never cut forest nearby, I have, a, I have this educated guess of what that original carbon was. But even in that ideal situation, um, no one will be able to predict for sure how long it will take to bring that, that soil back to that level because there is really so so many different things in play. Um, so besides of those plant microbial contributions, formation of soil structure, uh, soil mineral composition, um, environment, uh, you know, the, the temperature, the, the precipitation, the water regime of the soil, the texture of the soil, all those, the mineralogy, well, I don't get me started. So there is very long list of the factors that would um, de define how quickly carbon can be gained in that particular soil. Um, I can say that it's probably to bring it back to where it was. Uh, we probably are looking at several decades, but even a small improvement um, just you know, ten percent improvement of where it is now. Uh, it's already would be a, if we can achieve that on large spatial scale. Even that would be a good, um, good step forward. It, thank you. Uh, next, uh, next question uh, is from Ed, and it, I think it came in when you were talking about adding uh, manures. Um, does anyone have any? evidence of increased soil organic matter when the manure has added biostimulants? Um, I'm not, I'm not, um, I have to say, even though I'm a big fan of manure, a concept of manure, manuring soil in general, I, this is not part of um, my research um, expertise. So i my guess would be that there are probably studies that look at that, and I don't see why, um, why presence of any additions in the manure, why it would prevent its positive effect on soil organic matter. But again, I cannot, I haven't really studied that topic. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vicky has a question. How much does quality of residue impact the return to the soil? Um, so quality is that, that part of that recalcitrance versus being labile question. And um, again, as, yeah, it's it also there is, it's with soil, it's everything is always so complicated and it all depends on um, texture and hydrology and you name it. But in general, so the labile uh, high quality residues they are the ones that stimulate my microorganisms, and they are the ones that, in general, we believe are better than um, than low quality residues when it comes to, to a big picture of soil carbon gains. Okay, uh, Diane has a question. How far down in the soil profile did the studies of cover crops measure soil carbon? 
Uh, that's an excellent question. And this is something that um, oh, we as a soil, soil researchers, community of soil researchers in general, we are guilty of uh, looking at um, having a tendency to look at the uh, top, you know, plowed layer. Um, and we have two, there are two reasons. One is, uh, of course, it's the easiest uh, logistically and technically. But the other reason in our defense is that this is where we expect the changes will take place the quickest. So we are, if we are seeing um, changes in the topsoil, then there is a hope to look uh, further. But overall, there are not that many uh, studies that looked at um, soil cover crop, uh, gains to soil carbon from cover crops. Um, but there are some such studies, and uh, Gallic Biological Station is where I'm at. Uh, that's one of the places where people are doing this deep core sampling and looking at what are the benefits um, you know, below the plowed layer. And uh, the other answer is very positive. Yes, there, there definitely are benefits below ground. And um, in that respect, uh, cover crops are more uh, uh, more positive, or I should say, you know, better choice might be than no-till because as you might have heard some uh, in some locations, in some conditions, people are actually observing that no-till, uh, long-term no-till can lead to carbon gains um, in the topsoil while lo lower carbon um, deeper. So this is actually something that uh, to my knowledge, uh, has not been observed with cover crops that they they help soil gain carbon in the topsoil and uh, in the subsoil as well. Okay, the next question from Jean: Do cover crops increase long-term stable mineral-associated organic matter at depth? It still appears to lose carbon. Is less worth <laughs> is less worth than without cover crops adequate to get to where we need to be? Um, I guess it depends on, um, as I say, that's, that's the difficulty of working with soils because they're, they are so diverse and uh, these carbon gain processes that, you know, I was talking about and tons of others that I couldn't cover in a short talk, uh, they very much uh, depend on soil characteristics. So what works in most places, as I would say, in most places, cover crops lead to carbon gains. But even as you, um, if you might have paid attention to one of those graphs I was showing from a compilation of several studies on cover crops, um, there were a few where they showed losses of uh, carbon uh, with, with cover crops. Uh, very few of, you know, just three or so out of the that large number, but still they were there. And um, yeah, looking at specific soil characteristics and why it happened, where it happened, that that would be something to think about. But yeah, it's it is possible that there might be sites, uh, might be soils that behave very differently from um, others. Okay, Jessica has a, a question. If it took 12 years to increase soil organic matter by 0.2% uh, for carbon, how are the carbon markets going to show an increase to pay on or show increase in general after one year? Now, that's a great question, I think. Well, I don't, yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe I should keep my mouth shut for this question, but um, as a person who's been measuring soil carbon for, you know, last 25 years or so, um, and knowing how highly variable it is, so besides it's, uh, as I was saying, the, the amount of gains that you can generate uh, being so finicky uh, based on the soil characteristics, there is also a lot of inherent variability. So as far as carbon credits, I... I have serious doubts that it is feasible to actually pay for carbon gains based on the measurements. I think people should be paid for 
doing the right things and just assuming that, you know, not now, but in say five, 10, uh, 15 years, the carbon gains will be there. Um, so just, yeah, that's again, that's my personal opinion that instead of trying to quantify what is very difficult to quantify, people just should be paid for doing the, um, using the right um, sustainable measurement um, approaches in, in their farming. Okay, very good. Uh, we'll pivot to uh, another question with biochar. Uh, have you done any work with biochar as per adding uh, recalcitrant carbon materials? Um, personally, I haven't, but I, I think, yeah, I, I like the, the idea very much. So to me is on par with, you know, the manure and compost additions that, you know, direct additions of carbon into the soil. Um, but again, uh, yeah, that they are, that there are a lot of, of course, logistics and uh, management and all kinds of difficulties with each, each one of those systems. Okay, just uh, Jean put a, a link in the chat box, uh, a 30 year integrated cropping system trial from Wisconsin, so of uh, different systems. So if people wanna go take a look at that, you can go in and, and, uh, and grab that. Um, uh, Gene asks, uh, very surprised to see soybeans continuous or in rotation had higher sequestration than continuous corn, given the amount of residue uh, both produce. Any reason why this is the case? Well, um, my understanding that this is quite, that's one of those, um, one of those questions that is really depends on soil characteristics and tied to soil variability. But in theory, to me, that makes perfect sense because, uh, you know, corn would be adding this more recalcitrant, lower quality residues to the soil. And a lot of it would come on uh, as a surface residue, which, again, it seems that it really doesn't make that much of an impact as far as uh, gaining soil carbon goes, while soybean being legume um, does have a higher quality, uh, more labile input. So that's what I would expect. But from what I read, I know that people were showing things both ways. And again, that's probably because uh, specific soil properties play such a big role into how much uh, those different processes, um, the magnitudes of contributions of those different processes. Okay, uh, Leland has a question. In the in the U.S. Midwest, uh, many wetlands have been drained. Are there studies that compared wetland storage of of seed to uh, crop field storage? Uh, what role have decades of wetland drainage played in the overall loss of sea in agricultural landscapes? Um, so, my again, this is something that I'm not really and not part of my research. Uh, so not something that I can speak about as an expert. What my general understanding is that as soon as the wetland is drained, so wetlands get yeah, that because of anaerobic conditions in that poorly drained soil, and as you probably can see everywhere, you know, there are those spots of muck soil uh, in the fields that used to be the wetland or something that stayed poorly drained for a very long time. So yeah, they, they do have higher, um, they do have very high amounts of carbon stored. Um, and as soon as we train them and start using them in agriculture, um, my understanding that there is a very substantial loss of that, of that carbon that they have stored that takes place right there um, by the sheer um, creating the um, access of oxygen to to all that carbon and to microorganisms that then spread there that are very effective, much more effective in decomposing um, organic than the anaerobic uh, organisms. Okay, uh, Jeff has a question. How can farmers be convinced to increase cropping diversity and more complex rotations? Now, that, that might be a... That's an interesting question as well. <laughs> I yeah, that's 
that's really would be not, um, yeah, not my area of expertise. Yeah. But yeah, I think, you know, building it into this um, carbon trading, and again, it's in my idealistic and very far from any pra knowledge of practic practicalities in this field, but, you know, idealistic view of paying people for doing the right thing that might be the way to do it. Yeah, in, in my my experience, you know, you know, it, it, it will be it has to be the economic advantage to 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 do that, and that can be with carbon markets and and those types of things. So that's a question that's that's kind of out there and needs to be answered. Uh, Jessica has one. Uh, can there be a larger push for more diversity within urban landscapes? There is no mow fescue lawns, but are there urban options to sequester carbon as well? Yeah. Um, I suppose, yeah, that's, again, this is the, uh, not my area of expertise, yeah. and I mm -hmm. didn't really think much about yeah. that. Yeah, Leland has a comment, and to kind of answers that a couple down, I'm kind of scrolling through these. So um, he answers, urban areas, uh, native perennial gardening, use vacant lots, rooftop drainage are some of the options I think that can be considered. Uh, Jessica has a comment as well for urban, to answer that urban question. Um, Bruce has a question, what was... Uh, was most of the research outcomes you presented done on annual cropping systems or was some of it from pasture or forage production systems that are generally perennial in nature? Um, so the, the work that um, my group um, was involved with is um, annual corn soybean wheat systems with or without cover crops, uh, continuous corns, um, corn soybean rotations, and uh, recently, uh, we moved in more into bioenergy crops like that switchgrass, monoculture switchgrass, and old field vegetation. So working with uh, now the um, restored prairies and uh, poplars and all those uh, perennial types of vegetation that are candidates for bioenergy stock production. Um, yeah, and so just, just my personal experience that that perennial system is really the way to go if one wants to um, speed up soil carbon gains. Diverse perennial systems, I should say. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jean has a, a question. What would the addition of manure, either applied or through grazing, do to increase the rate of carbon accumulation? I think it should, I think it, it will have a fairly quick effect in most soils. Again, it depends on, will depend on inherent soil characteristics. I would think that the effect would be faster and more profound and more long lasting in the soils with a uh, loamy clay type of uh, texture and in the soils with, uh, you know, Montmorillonite clays uh, that can store more of that carbon. But think probably in every type of soil there should be fairly quick um, um, gains seen. Well, I mean, some of it will not be long lasting, but um, as I was showing, at least one or 2% of what we're adding is stored. So in theory, something like manure, the more you add, at least one or 2% will stay long time. Okay, Matt has a question. How do northern states compare to southern states in regards to soil carbon building potential? Um, that, that would be quite complex question because it's not just the northern versus south as far as temperatures, but it also the the texture and mineralogy that matters. So it's not you know, it's not a coincidence that some of those um, soils with those best soils, Iowa, Illinois, uh, with highest carbon uh, storages, that they are where they are. They are located on Mount Marlinite, um, 
uh, clays or soils was that are rich in that type of mineral and that is particularly good for this long-term soil carbon storage. But in general, yeah, I suppose that as temperatures increases, so does the um, increase the, the speed of microbial activity increases as well. So that that bound to have an effect of what what will be happening with soil carbon storage. But I wouldn't really, yeah, I don't think I can tell you, you know, north versus south. That's the, the difference will be such and such. Okay, thank you. Uh, I invite everybody to kind of look in the chat because some people are answering some of those questions and responding to some of those, which I, I think are really good answers. But I'm gonna skip down to Kevin. Uh, microbial activity generates CO2, which is lost to the atmosphere. How much, how does that amount compare to the amount it helps store? Um, it's probably, you know, well, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to go to one of those slides I showed, but you know, the one that I showed was that breakdown on what goes where. So yeah, 2% 2 2 of it is stored and everything else is lost to the atmosphere. That's, that's, that's the thing. But um, basically the more they, they, the more active they are, the more processing uh, they do, the, the more on the right uh, soil texture and mineralogical condition can be saved as a, as a byproduct that goes for long-term storage. Um, okay. Okay, another question. Is it possible that the observed variability in organic carbon found in soils is due to the sources of data, i.e. Uh, bulk soil versus fractions of soil? silt clay micro macro aggregates um so variability in soil um okay so what what traditionally um people do to assess uh, what is the soil carbon level in in the large um, area is that they would take a composite sample so they would take um uh, multiple soil samples from preferably exactly the same depth from multiple representative locations, then you would put it in a bucket, mix it very well. So then you would have what would be a representative sample of uh, the soil of that field. And you would take multiple subsamples from that for your, um, um, for your analysis. Uh, but the thing is that if we would measure uh, specifically each one of those little sites from uh, where that composite big sample come from, we would have quite diverse values, even if we were doing exactly the same, uh, you know, exactly following this, exactly the same laboratory procedures. And I can tell you more that even if we would take this like soil, piece of soil that is about this big, you know, like, half an inch, quarter of inch. Um, and that's, that's what we've done in my lab at some point. We separated uh, those um, quarter inch soil aggregates into tiny pieces, and some cases into like 10, 20 little pieces. And we measured soil carbon in each one of them. And a coefficient of variation for that carbon that comes from just with the thin, this aggregate, it was swooping 70%. So even that at that very small scale, there is a huge variation in um, in, in what how much carbon is in a particular site within that soil. And that depends on a variety of things. You know, plant root live there, the carbon next to it will be much, much higher than uh, in the next two millimeters where that plant root wasn't reaching. Um, there is a piece of clay material that was protecting that carbon. Carbon there would be much higher than if there was like a big crane of sand with, uh, with large pores around it where it wasn't protected. And so what we then observing at the lab, when we do our measurements at large scale, it's uh, fortunately it integrates a lot of that variability, but still uh, when it comes to studying the processes of what 
actually happens with carbon when it goes into the soil, when it goes out, we have to deal with an ex extreme level of uh, spatial variability even at the micro scale. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liam has a question. Do microbial fertilizers aid in carbon sequestration? I, I would presume they should be, but this is not something that I ever studied. Okay. The next question from Kevin, do soils reach an equilibrium of carbon content such that there is a limit to carbon content increase? Um, yes, yes, they do. So they, they do have that uh, limit and that limit depends on a large number of things. Uh, it depends on that the texture and structure and poor architecture that I was talking about and that mineralogy that I talked about. Um, it also depends on the hydrology, like, you know, back to that discussion of uh, wetlands. So um, how much uh, oxygen access um, is in that soil. It also depends on the type of vegetation that um, that is on that soil and um, that vegetation effect would play a role through um, both the quantity and quality um, of the inputs that it puts in on uh, the, chem the chemical compositions, like, you know, some uh, forests would actually lead to uh, a lot of carbon gains while others might be leaching it. Um, and also it would depend, well, on the manner in, in which those uh, those plants put carbon in. So like, for example, that's that's why that prairie, uh, diverse prairie vegetation with grasses and prairie uh, herbs, that's why it was so good, um, always so good in building soil carbon is again, not by who it is and what they put it and where and how they put it. Okay, thank you. There's some yeah, the, the, the the equilibrium question is very very complex and complicated. And now Diane makes a comment uh, with regard to it. So we're going to slip down. Now there's there's one more question, or probably a couple questions. Uh, um, and Jean puts in: Would changing the percent clay in the soil change its ability to accumulate carbon? I yeah, in theory it should be, but again, there is there is a lot of. Um, a lot of questions of which soil, what clay, um, you know, how much. So if there is already soil rich in clay, then yes, that adding any extra probably wouldn't do any good. But I suppose if there is a very sandy soil, yeah, then adding clay, especially uh, those uh, Montmorillonite clays, uh, yeah, I suppose if one somehow can do it and can practically accomplish that at a reasonable cost, that that would be a big uh, boost in uh, to all those subsequent measures to in, to protect carbon, to increase carbon. You know. Okay, I think we're kind of towards the end. I I guess. Uh... Gene does have a comment. We just need uh, we need just grazing fire in ten thousand years, <laughs> and, and that that might be a way to to, to end because uh, that's the end of our comments. And uh, I like that. Yep. <laughs> so with, with that, uh, thanks again, Sasha. We really appreciate appreciate you sharing your expertise with us on what is a, a very timely but yet very complex uh, complex uh, issue.